here's a man that gave a million dollars back in the stock trade. Why would you do that if, if you hadn't done something wrong or someone did something wrong? Well, what people didn't know was he gave a million back, dollars back in the stock trade. In the exchange, he got dropped out of a very serious money laundering investigation. that had nothing to do with me. And the man he wired the money to, he let him go to prison. And I, and, and I go to prison for 31 months and my daughter commits suicide. So Phil's no longer a friend of mine. So, Billy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the Golfer's Journal podcast. Absolutely love the book. Uh, I really appreciate getting an advanced copy and being able to have this conversation. Um, just want to start out by asking um, why the book? Why was it so important to you to write, to you to write this book? Well, I've, I've, lived a, I've lived a pretty wild and crazy life, and uh, I'm not getting any younger. And uh, uh, it was just something I felt like that I, I had to do, I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to tell my story for a number of reasons. I felt like I could uh, help a lot of people uh, who've had uh, dark moments in their life, who've dealt with difficulties, addictions, things such as that. Uh, it's a... Uh, the book is uh it's a uh it's everything in the world that i know about sports betting uh uh there's not one thing that i know about sports betting uh it it is a complete recipe for sports betting and uh uh i love gamblers i love sports bettors it's uh in my age is something that i wanted to share with them uh regardless of of what your uh of what your uh, what level of interest you have in sports, uh, whether you're a novice, you don't bet, or whether you're, you know, uh, a professional. There's something here for everyone. Uh, the person who doesn't even bet, if they read the sports part of it, but they're, they're going to find some things that involve the, the outcome of sporting events they never considered uh, before. And I think it will give them more of an understanding, uh, even even at their level, of watching sports than they currently have. Uh, the other levels of sports, the I was amazed uh, all these years. There's there's nothing out there that gives a sports better any indication about what the right fair price is to buy buy points or or how does a money line compare to the line on a game? What is the fair price? Uh, if you're betting on a parlay or a teaser, uh, what what's a, what are the true odds that you're that you're laying? You know, it's you're not laying 11 to 10. Maybe many people think they are, but they're they're laying you know a much higher price. Uh, they're laying sometimes a dollar 30, dollar 35 instead of laying 11 to 10. Now, if you know that and you want to do it, fine, go ahead and do it. But at least now the charts and things that I put in the book, there won't be any question about what the value of a half point is, uh, whether you're paying a fair price or not. If you want to pay more than a fourth, go ahead and pay it. But at least you're going to know you're paying more. And the same thing goes if you want a better parlay or teaser. Uh, understand the price you're paying. More importantly, it gives you a betting strategy in there. And without the betting strategy, uh, I don't think you can win. I mean, you've got to shop around. you got to get the best price. you got to get the best number. And they do change uh uh, there's there's quite a bit of difference if you, you shop around and you look. And, you you, you know, you've you got to have a money management system, too, because what happens with so many people gambling, it happened to me when I was much younger, you know, you get loser and uh, and, and here comes this Sunday night game or this Monday night game, well, I'm going to get even, okay? Well, <clears throat> you, you really shouldn't be betting on the game because, you know, you, you really don't like either side, but uh, you get so much loser, you, it... it, it you know, everybody likes to side once they're loser. They're ready to bet on anything, you know, to get uh, to get their money back. Well, you don't do that. You must have a strategy. And I put all, you know, I've done enough losing for all of us. Uh, you know, I've I've been uh, I've been from rags to riches, from rags to riches at least 50 times and more. I've, I've been broke more times than probably anyone you'll ever talk to. But uh, uh, like I said. I've done all the losing for all of us, and, and what I've shared in the book is, is hopefully how to avoid that 
and more importantly, it gives you a much, much better chance to, to win, regardless of what the sport is, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, whether you're betting on a golf tournament. It, it's really all the same principles. Well, no doubt. It, and I learned as a casual sports gambler myself, I, I definitely learned a lot. There's a, a good portion of the book is dedicated to teaching people how to how to bet better um, and, and how to uh, have more fun and how to know what they're doing. Uh, the, the part of the book that really struck me, though, um, and, and I think it's the majority of the book, is, is you, is your life. You've lived an extraordinary life life uh, uh you a hundred lives in one it feels like and it's just it's it's amazing to read i mean the book is called gambler where did you get this not everyone's cut from that same cloth that that tolerance for risk that ability to take on risk that enjoyment of risk where did that come from for you it's really odd i, <clears throat> I was uh i was raised up in uh Two sort of different environments. I was raised up in a small rural town in central Kentucky. I was raised by a grandmother who, <clears throat> you know, the first places I remember going outside of our home was to church. We went to we went to Sunday school. <clears throat> we went to church afterwards. We went to training, you know, Sunday night prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and I went to a Christian youth organization on Saturday night. Uh, but my grandmother, she uh, she worked a couple of jobs and. Uh, uh, we didn't have any kindergartens in uh, the little town I was in, and uh, so my uncle owned a pool room. And uh, so my grandmother, she started leaving me at my uncle's pool room when I was four years old. And uh, he, uh, to pacify my time, he put me on a uh, on a pool table in the back of the pool room with some Coca-Cola cases stacked up and a pool cue, and he went back to work. And uh, so... Uh, my life uh, in my formative years, uh, I spent a lot of time in church. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the pool room, and uh, and I spent a lot of time working. But uh, so I look at myself today, and I'm really the same guy that I was when I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, but I was raised. I've been raised up around gambling my entire life. My father was a gambler. My uncle was a gambler. And my two cousins were gamblers. Uh, and the way of life at where I lived, uh, you know, and, and in, Kentucky, in Kentucky in general and, and the South in general at that period of time, <clears throat> you know, gambling was just a way of life. I mean, horse racing was in Kentucky in the 1800s. Uh, um, you know, uh, casinos, nightclubs were in Kentucky and Newport prior to Las Vegas. So <clears throat> the, the area that uh, the part of the world I lived in, uh, the way I was raised, uh, I'm sure that had a lot to do with uh, with me, you know, uh, being. But 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 more importantly, <clears throat> from the first moment that I made a bet, uh, uh, I, I love gambling. I love risk taking. Uh, it was something that uh, I don't know. It 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 just made me feel alive, so to speak, I guess. And uh, I, I really enjoyed competition. I'm very competitive today. So I, I think a combination of those things is probably uh, what made me the man, uh, the man I am today. Well, tell us about that first bet. You talk about it in the book. Uh, it doesn't go the way maybe people thought would think that a Billy Walters bet would go. Well, it wasn't actually my first bet. My first bet was like I was playing penny nine ball in a pool room when I was six, seven years old. But uh, <clears throat> the first significant bet was... I worked. Uh, I had a paper out, and I worked for two years, and I'd saved my money up. <clears throat> and I was a New York Yankee fan. I mean, boy, the Mickey Mantle, uh, Whitey Ford, uh, the Yankee team. I knew every player, and <clears throat> I had a <clears throat> excuse me. I had a friend of mine, and uh, he and his dad. They were big Brooklyn Dodgers fans, and he was all about Duke Snyder and the Dodgers, and and of course the Yankees that beat them a number of World Series in a row. So the World Series came up, and uh, I was just sure the Yankees were going to beat uh, the Dodgers. And uh, so his father, uh, uh, I had a, a 120, 25 bucks saved up, whatever it was. It's, it's in the book. And uh, so we, I bet all the money I had on the Yankees to beat the Dodgers in that World Series. And uh, unfortunately, uh, 
that's the only time the Brooklyn Dodgers ever beat the New York Yankees in the World Series. So <laughs> I lost all the money I had, and it taken me two years of this paper out to save this money up. But uh, it, uh, I, you know, I guess the old gambler's lament is uh, the only thing better than winning is losing. So uh, that all that did was just made me more determined to to gamble and and win. So. Well, that that's an interesting. Uh, when you talk about that in the book, about the best, the next best thing to winning is, is losing and and getting back at it. And and there is time and time again, especially early in the book and earlier in your earlier years, you pick yourself back up off the mat. And that to me is not not something that everybody can do. And I think that's one of the inspiring parts of the story, whether it be gambling or wherever in your life you've been you've been beaten and you're down on the mat. Um, how do you get back up? Um, how do you overcome um, that, that sort of, as you say, going from rags to riches again and again, not everyone has the constitution to keep, keep fighting. Uh, I think that's an inspiring part of the book. Um, where does that come from in you? I think, I think probably that comes possibly from my childhood. <clears throat> you know, I lost both parents. I bought, I lost my father when I was a year and a half old. He passed away, and my mother. I, she left. I was raised by a grandmother, and I think probably uh, the circumstance of of of, of my childhood. Uh, I think possibly that had something to do with the resilience of it. I could have had four parents, and I couldn't have had a, a better role model than my grandmother. And uh, so the. Uh, when it came to uh, not giving up, when it came to uh, overcoming adversity, uh, I think because I, f- I faced so much adversity, especially at an early age, I, you know, to me, when those things happen, one of two things either occur. You either you can either deal with it or you can't deal with it. Some people deal with it better than others, and and I became. Uh, pretty good at dealing that dealing with it your grandmother is definitely one of the big heroes of the story and and you tell that story of your youth really well and it's it was interesting to me i mean you say you're the the same person now that you were then but different practices (laughs) but Mm -hmm. certainly right as as a younger man um the gambling the cycle of the sort of gambling and and drinking i mean it, it does make your head spin to read um losing a house and losing this and then getting it back and that back and forth is 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 wild um how do you go but then you know by the end of the story you know you're running multinational companies you have a uh you're a golf course owner and operator you're you've, you've achieved this level of even like corporate and business success that's that's uh very um that's incredibly impressive what's the turning point how do you where do you i guess where along the point where along the way does does that younger Billy change into the into the Billy we know now? Well, well, well you're 100 percent correct. When I was younger, uh, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, not, not, you know, I'm not making any excuses, but I didn't have. I lost my grandmother at 15, and <clears throat> pretty much after that, I was on my own. So, whatever mistakes I made, uh, you know, I learned them the hard way. I got a lot of knots on my head, and. Uh, I drank, and when I drank, my personality changed, my judgment changed. Uh, I, I, I did a lot of really uh, dumb, stupid things. I didn't realize I had a drinking problem because I didn't drink that often. But when I drank, uh, I drank until I got obliterated, and 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 then the things that happened after that. Uh, uh, you know, they they almost every issue I ever had in my life, I had it because I was drinking. And uh, so there were a number of things that happened in my life over a period of time <clears throat> the, uh, that changed my life. And uh, I've been married almost 47 years. Uh, I, uh, that was the number one uh, beginning thing that happened. I married an incredible lady <clears throat> who knew me, knew me very well. There were no secrets about who I was or what she was marrying. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, she's been just uh, uh, an absolute uh, you know, I couldn't have had a greater partner in life. And then <clears throat> eventually I quit drinking and I quit smoking. Uh, the smoking was obviously, it was injuring, it was 
it was harmful to my health, but it didn't affect my, 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 you know, my, you know, my ability to make poor judgments. The drinking did. So when I finally quit drinking, uh, that was when, uh, you know, I, I, you know, prior to, you know, prior to quitting drinking, I made a lot of money. Uh, in the seventies, I was making six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year in the seventies. I never accumulated any money because I lost all of my money because I lost my money because eventually I'd get around to drinking. I'd do dumb things. But more importantly, I had a very high, high risk. I mean, the risk tolerance was, as you say, I, I lost my home playing poker. So that tells you about the risk tolerance I had. So, uh, but when I quit drinking, uh, I quit making bad decisions and the good decisions I was making prior to that, uh, I can, you know, they, they became mostly all the decisions I was making. So as a result, uh, uh, I became a lot more successful in everything that I did. And, uh, uh, but you're right. <clears throat> the, you know, I'm known as a sports better. I mean, that's because of, I, I guess, my reputation as a sports better, but all the time I was betting sports, you know, I, I had seven golf courses in Las Vegas. I had 22 automobile dealerships. Uh, I had a stock portfolio that was actually much bigger than what I was doing with uh, <clears throat> with the sports. So I had a lot of different things that I was doing, but being married to an incredible partner, uh, I quit drinking. Clearly, I'm getting a little older, too, and I got more experience, and uh, I think a combination of all those things. Uh, I'll tell you something else that happened in my life that <clears throat> really probably uh, redirected me substantially, too. <clears throat> my oldest son, when he was seven years old, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor, and uh, he was only given 30 days to live, and uh, there's no question that uh, no, he's still alive today, uh, you know, through a miracle. Uh, but there's no question that that when that happened, that also changed me as a man. And uh, so I, I think it was a combination of things, Tom, that, that happened. It wasn't any one thing. It wasn't like I woke up one day and I had this epiphany and uh, and, and something changed. That wasn't, that, that wasn't the case. Understood. In that section of the book, um, it's very hard to read. It's it's terrifying to read as a father, and um, we're so happy to hear that your 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 son is still with us. The honesty. I mean, there are moments in the book that will definitely. Uh, that was one of them that that do bring you to could certainly bring you to tears. And so your honesty in the book, um, again, I think is the inspiring element of it. In terms of um, you know people out there dealing with real stuff, and and this is a book that. Uh, you can read about someone who's who's gotten through it. Um, something that's else that's had a huge role in your life and has a big role in the story uh, is golf. How did you pick up golf and what role? Um, it was kind of interesting. You talked about growing up in a pool hall and the role that maybe being a good pool player played in some of your golf. Yes, uh, the, the, the county that I was raised up in, in Kentucky, uh, there were no golf courses. We had no TV in our home, and uh, and I didn't really even know there was golf until I was I don't know 19, 20 years old. I was working at, at a at a car lot, and uh, a friend invited me to go to a range one night and hit some balls. And uh, I'd actually played with my wife's brother once, and then after that, I started to to go hit balls at a range. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I played uh, baseball. I was a decent baseball player, so my hand-to-eye coordination was decent. I, I was a, I was a pretty good pool player, so putting was really natural to me. And in golf, <clears throat> it was uh, like most people would get introduced to the great game. You know, at uh, I was smitten by the game. I couldn't play enough of it. And then, uh, but almost every friend that I have, either directly or indirectly, I met through the game of golf. And uh, so my entire life, I've been nothing but primarily a workaholic. The only hobby I've ever had is golf. And uh, so <clears throat> the uh, golf is, uh, it, it's played an enormous role in my life. 
When you get to Vegas, um, and it, it did seem like with a lot of golf, I think like with most of us or all of us, there's something on the line. Uh, when you get to Vegas, you get into some interesting action and some and some games and uh, experience the sort of golf hustler world out there. I thought that was um, that was incredibly interesting as a golfer. It's something I hadn't seen. Uh, tell us about some of the things that the hustlers or the cheaters would do uh, on the golf course that you might not see uh, on your typical golf course. Well, we actually played quite a bit of golf around Louisville, and uh, we did quite a bit of gambling there. And, of course, Las Vegas. Uh, I first time I went to Las Vegas was uh, 1968. I went on a trip, and I met Benny Benyon, and I met Kirk Corrin on the same trip. And uh, I, was, I was in my early 20s. But I started spending some time in Las Vegas in the 70s and uh, uh, became friends with uh, the Binion family, with Jack Binion. <clears throat> Jack, uh, every June, after the World Series of Poker, uh, he had a golf tournament. It was called uh, the Gamblers Invitational. And uh, Jack would invite uh, poker players, gamblers from around the country, and he would invite customers. And uh, and he, he had this golf tournament, and he matched everyone up. And, Jack was the one who set the handicap, and uh, if you played in it, you put in five thousand uh, bucks. You had to commit to play a minimum of a five hundred dollar Nassau per day with with whoever Jack matched you up with, and it was a three day deal. And uh, but you could bet whatever you wanted to bet, and uh, or you could bet anyone else who was playing in the tournament, or you could make team bets or whatever. No one ever bet five hundred dollars. I mean, uh, the matches were. You know, some matches were hundred thousand. Some matches you know, you win or lose two hundred thousand. And uh, of course, everybody's trying to take the best of it. Uh, the uh, you know guys are you know. But Jack actually did a. I mean, considering the group of people that were there, Jack did a great job in handicapping the golf tournament. I mean, he didn't get everybody hundred percent right, but he did a really good job. And then you had guys that would uh, try to cheat and. Uh, they were a minority. They, they they weren't many, but there were some. And and then what those guys would do? I mean, clearly you had you had to watch them like a hawk. I mean, they'd drop a ball. They they would uh, they'd do whatever. And then on top of that, they uh, if you left your golf clubs at uh, golf course at night, they'd get the guy in the bag room and they'd bend the lofts and lies on your on your irons, or they would take your putter and they'd move your grip a little bit. And uh, uh, and uh, if they could get access to your golf balls you know they sometimes switch the balls out and they put balls on there that you know that they shot full of mercury or something and uh, so and then in certain cases you had to be real careful about what you drink because sometimes they make you your drink so if you were drinking water or whatever you had to keep a pretty good eye on it but there weren't many, there, i mean and then some guys they would have like a you know a putter that was magnetized and they would use a lead penny they marked their ball with a lead penny, and then uh, while you were putting, you were focused on putting. You know, they put that putter on top of that lead penny, and then when your ball was rolling, they, they would step forward and then slide that, that lead penny off that putter, and they'd steal a three feet or something, uh, or two feet or whatever. A lot of them, when they marked the ball, uh, where they had maybe a side hill lie, they would mark it towards you, try to straighten the putt out, do things like that. So... Uh, I mean, the majority of the people that played in the tournament were, they weren't doing that. Uh, there sure. were some that did, but everybody in the tournament was trying to take the best of them from a handicapping standpoint. If, if a guy could, you know, pass himself off as a, as a, as a 10 instead of a six, you know, he was going to do that. But I mean, uh, as far as just outright cheating, there wasn't a lot of that, but there was some. What do you think is the most you ever played for on a golf course? Well, the most I ever played for was uh, whatever that amount of money was that I couldn't pay off. And I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've done that a number of times. I've been out there, and uh, if, if I lost, I, I couldn't have paid. So uh, that's that's the most I ever played for. And luckily, I never – I mean, there might, there might, I went to El Paso, Texas once, and I lost more money. I, I, I ended up betting everybody down there and uh, – uh, I, I didn't. I bet more money than I realized when I got done. I I couldn't. I couldn't pay everybody. I I, I think I lost two hundred eighty thousand. I, I paid off two hundred of it. That's what I brought with me, and I had to <laughs> had to send the eighty back. But uh, that was most I ever played for. Is 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 
it was one I didn't have the money to pay off with. I bet. You have a great story in the book. Uh, I just want to get one of your gamb- golf gambling stories. Um, an all-night session and then going to play with one club. Yeah, I was in. Uh, I was actually in Louisville, and uh, I was at a joint called the Domino Lounge, and I was with a fellow named uh, Danny Matthews and a guy named Calvin Ash. Uh, Calvin uh, ended up becoming my best friend in the world, and we were there. We were drinking all night, and we both, all three of us, you know, you know, the whole conversation was all about golf uh, the entire time. All we talked about was golf, and we talked about, you know, making this better, that better. Guys were going back and forth to try to and anyway so we ended up making this bet uh i was going to play the jeff elks club in jeffersonville indiana and uh, they bet me i couldn't uh make a bogey on this par five but not i wasn't the greatest golfer in the world at the time but i you know i played okay and we drank all night and we got drunk and frankly we, we sobered up a little bit we but we were still about half drunk so we drove over to uh the jeff elks in jeffersonville indiana and uh pro was there his name was big jim barber and uh so we pulled up front and calvin asked him said what do you charge to run a golf cart for one hole and the guy said we don't run any golf carts for one hole so calvin explained to him what we wanted to do and the guy says okay you have a golf cart he, he was just curious he wanted to go out and see it so we went out and then uh, we played this one hole and uh luckily for me i won the money and uh but i won two thousand bucks from these guys uh and uh but we've been up all night and it's like a lot of stories when you get to drinking you know next thing you know we end up making this bet pretty bad when sun up came the next morning we went and and uh we, we went and fulfilled you the made bet it happen yeah one i think you played it with a one iron Is i did right? i teed off with a one iron and yeah. then uh hit the second shot with a three iron and then hit the third shot with a nine iron and then uh I went up and I putted with uh, the one iron and uh, and like I say, luckily won the money. There you go. The uh, so not only you know you've had success. It's it's pretty great to follow as an obsessed golfer, and most of our listeners are as well to follow your progress as a golfer. Uh, you enlist the help of. I mean, in the back of the book, you 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 thank. You talk about getting help from, gosh, so many people. <laughs> but that's like all of us. And you had yeah. access to them, which is great. I mean, yeah. from Dave Pels to the Harmons, there's a great story about when you meet David Ledbetter and you have to admit something to him. Uh, can you tell us about that? Well, no, I was playing in a World Series of Poker. <clears throat> and uh, I have a friend in Orlando, Florida. His name is Dewey Tomko. We've been friends for 50 years. And uh, Dewey was sitting next to me, and I looked up, and there was – rather tall guy and another guy and they were watching us play poker i didn't know who they were <clears throat> so i asked asked Dewey, i said who's, who's these guys he said well that one guy's uh david ledbetter and the other guy's david frost and he said david ledbetter is a golf teacher and uh explained to me who he was at that time uh i don't know i played like 10 or 11 years uh, i never hit a golf shot without grease on it uh, I was and understand something about putting grease on a golf club. I mean, I wasn't sneaking doing it. We all used it. It was just part of the part of the handicap. But I learned to play golf with grease. And I was playing with uh, uh, a ping driver, but it was a wooden face ping driver. And back in those days, the sweet spots weren't as big as they are today, and they weren't, you know, drivers weren't nearly as user friendly. But with that grease on that golf club, I could hit it a long ways and. I went for five years. I never had a ball out of bounds. <clears throat> so we go down. We're having lunch. Uh, David, Frosty, uh, doing myself. And uh, <clears throat> I was talking to, uh, to David Ledbetter, and I said, you know, uh, I've never hit a, you know, hit, hit a, any a ball without grease. I like to learn how to play golf, uh, you know, without putting grease on, 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 on a golf club. He said, well, come down to Greenleaf. And he said, I'll show you. So Dewey lived at Greenleaf, so I fly down to Greenleaf. David's teaching there, and it was we go to the driving range, and I pull out this pink driver without the grease on it. And the first shot I hit, I must have sliced it 50 yards. 
And I, I looked at David's face, and it was like, oh, my God. I don't think he'd ever seen anybody that shot that sliced that far or, or, or anyone that hit it that hard that sliced that far. So that began the uh, merry-go-round of, of golf, golf teachers and, uh, and instruction. Up until that, I'd only taken one golf lesson in my life. I'd taken it off of a guy named Bob Hamilton, an old-timer who won the PGA who lived in Evansville, Indiana, and he gave me a short game lesson. And But after I met David, I, I went I went and worked with David for a while at Greenleaf and at Lake Nona, and it just got so far to travel, uh, I, I quit going there. And then uh, Jim Colbert is a really good friend of mine, one of the best friends I have, and he introduced me to Jimmy Ballard. And... Uh, and, uh, and I met Jimmy. I worked with Jimmy, and uh, and then uh, years. I was back in the, I guess, uh, late nineties. Uh, oh, not late nineties. Probably the early nineties. I bought some property in Houston, Texas, uh, during the SNL crisis. Uh, I bought a bunch of property out there uh, next to Lock and Var, uh, and it was property that belonged to Nelson Bunker Hunt. And there was some property in an industrial section. So I was flying down there to meet with the land planners and what have you. So John Schroeder is a good friend of mine. And John and I were members at the farms in uh, Rancho Santa Fe. We were playing golf a lot. And uh, so I told John I was going to ride down. Well, John was friends with Butch Harmon. And and uh, he said, well, you know, he's telling me about Butch Harmon, how great a teacher he was, how great a guy he was. So John flew down with me and uh, he took me over to Lock and Var, introduced me to Butch Harmon. That's how I met Butch. And Butch started giving me lessons. And he and I and Schroeder would play golf in the afternoon at Lock and Var. Butch and I became very good friends. And uh, that's how I met Butch. This, this was way prior to Butch moving to Las Vegas. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, over the years, that's one of the great things about the great game of golf. Uh, you know, like a lot of guys, I... I got paralysis by analysis. I thought, you know, it was it, it, if I wasn't playing good, it either had to be golf equipment or, or, or I needed a lesson, one of the two. So I went through that merry-go-round of a deal. And uh, But the good news was I learned something from every teacher I worked with uh, and, and became friends uh, or, 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 uh, with every teacher that I ever worked with. So it was an extremely positive experience. But it's, it's a lot like, of fun to read, yeah, and yeah. to read the book as a golfer and to see all these names popping up. Yeah. And yeah. It's funny, Billy. We're we're doing a similar thing at the Golfers Journal called the Index Experiment, where our members, right. subscribers, are working on their games and trying right. to a- achieve different goals uh, this season. So Greece is one we let, we have not put on the on the list yet. I mean, I forgot that if people don't even probably know anymore that you know Greece takes the spin off the ball. Well, um, I got to tell you, and, I got to tell you a little story uh, yeah, funny. about the. Pardon me for interrupting, but I'll tell you a little story no, yeah, about the Greece. Yeah. I think you find kind of interesting. You know, you're, <laughs> you've got some really core golfers on your show. Uh, Dick Helmstetter, the first president of Callaway Golf, uh, was a really good friend of mine, and I knew Dick prior to him taking that job when he came to, to Callaway. And back during that period of time, I was playing a lot of golf at La Costa. I was doing a lot of gambling there, and when I was didn't have a game, I would practice there a lot. And I was using Greece, and uh, I played golf some with Trevino, and and Trevino was playing tailor-made golf clubs then, and and uh, he had a driver. He could hit about 10 or 15 yards further, but about every two or three weeks, the face caved in on it. It wasn't strong enough. And uh, down below, there was a guy teaching golf down there. His name was Carl Welty. Yeah, he's a very famous teacher. And Carl, he had a school down there, and all the students, they would put tape on the face of the irons, and it was impact tape, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But if you ever put tape on the face of an iron, it will react the same way as a golf club will with grease. It takes a side spin off of it. You're going to hit the ball further, and, you, and you're not going to be able to slice it. If you remember in the old days, you, you take a set of irons out of the pro shop, they would always put tape on them. Well... I mean, you hit you hit everything great. I mean, you couldn't slice it; the ball went yeah. further, and you couldn't wait to buy that set of irons. The problem was when you took the tape off the face, uh, you didn't hit them quite as good. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so Helmstetter uh, he'd gone to work for Ely Callaway, and back in those days, they had 
wooden shafted clubs. That was really all they had, a couple old billet putters. So Dick came down there, and I knew Dick prior to coming there because Dick was a world-class pool cue maker in Japan, and I bought some pool cues from him. So anyway, uh, I told Dick, I said, look, the whole key to making these golf clubs is you got to make them where they act like they have grease on them. And if you look at the golf clubs today with uh, the way they're constructed, you know, it's almost impossible to slice a golf ball. Uh, you've really, really got, I mean, let, man, you could do that with a, a blade or something, but you buy these perimeter weight, you know, you buy these clubs that, uh, these user friendly golf clubs, it's almost impossible to slice them. And that, that's, that's actually the kind of way that they designed these golf, golf clubs to react today is if they've got grease on them. And of course yeah. the metal headed driver, uh, the, the, the driver that Trevino had, there was a guy named Dick Della Cruz, a guy named Richard Parente that came up with a design uh, for that driver uh, that, that that Trevino had. The only difference is the face wouldn't cave in. And that Callaway Golf bought that design from them. And that's how the Big Bertha, that's where the Big Bertha driver came from. And that, no to me, I, I think there are two things that have been big evolutions of golf, the sand wedge and the Big Bertha driver. And uh, that's where they came from. And luckily That's for me, really, that, luckily for me, yeah. when it came out, I didn't need as much grease. <laughs> I was going to say, no more grease. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's incredibly interesting. And people should know all those lessons they paid off. You won the AT&T, uh, the Pro-Am, uh, which is a cool cool part of the story as well. Um, and, and the names, again, from Jim Colbert to David Faraday, Ledbetter, and, and Bones are, are, are in the story. Um, another golf name that is in the story uh, and that, there's a lot of anticip anticipation uh, with this book about um, is the role that Phil Mickelson plays in the story and in your life. Um, in Alan Shibnook's book, uh, he describes Phil as presenting many different versions of himself to many different people that Phil sort of has a chameleon kind of um, that he's a lot of different folks. Who is Phil Mickelson to you? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, his analysis. I don't think anybody knows who Phil Mickelson is. Uh, but uh, what he was with me is uh, we were friends for eight years. Uh, we played uh, quite a bit of golf together. Uh, I thought we were friends. We had a betting partnership for five years. Uh, and uh, the uh, I'll be honest with you, you fool me, uh, because... Uh, uh, when I needed him to come forward and do nothing but just very simply tell the truth uh, about something uh, that happened in regards to uh, a legal case that I had in New York, uh, although he promised me he would do it, he didn't do it. And uh, I spent 31 months in prison. Uh, my daughter committed suicide. Uh, my son, who's extremely ill, I, I, uh, almost he almost passed away. And... Uh, that 31 months I spent in prison, uh, I believe uh, very strongly had Phil come forward and just done nothing but tell the truth. Uh, I don't think I would have ever gone to prison. Why do you think he didn't? Well, it's in the book why he didn't. And once you understand all the facts, I think it's pretty clear why he didn't. And uh, the uh, uh, Phil had, a, had an issue that had nothing whatsoever to do with me. Uh, mm -hmm. He was caught up into a money laundering investigation with two other people. And, and the money laundering investigation had been going on for quite some time uh, prior to me. And the gentleman that uh, he was involved with in the money laundering investigation, uh, he'd been doing business with guy off and on since 1995. And then what happened is uh, the... Uh, there was an opportunity for uh, him to, I believe, get out of that and uh, uh, and help the government uh, paint a picture of, of me of being guilty. Because what happened was, was Phil gave back almost a million dollars that he made in a stock trade. Uh, and then the authorities had a press conference uh, and anyone from the general public would look at that. Your first, your first uh, assumption is, well, why did he give a million dollars back? He he, he only gave the million dollars back. He, either he he was guilty or he's an innocent victim in an insider trading case. 
but regardless, it made me look guilty. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and that was, was the goal. And uh, so they created public perception out there by him giving us money back that I was guilty. Now the part that the public didn't know uh, that's in the book, uh, he had hired an attorney and, and as a result, uh, he was dropped out of the money laundering case. The man he wired the money to went to federal prison. I went to federal prison because he wouldn't come and testify. So he's got a money laundering case that's been going on for a long time prior to any questions coming up about the stock trade. And stock trade comes up. When it's time for him, when the SEC, when they ask him to be interviewed, he took the Fifth Amendment. Okay. And then all at once, he comes forward. Uh, they give this almost million dollars back. The government comes out with a press release that he gave this money back. They create the perception in the public that he's either an innocent victim or he's guilty and he bought his way out. But regardless, it makes me look guilty. Okay. And, and then he gets dropped out of this money laundering case that was extremely serious. And the man that he wired the $2.8 million to that, that he asked to do it for him as a favor, that man went to prison. So uh, when I went to trial in New York, I knew uh, the government wasn't going to call Phil because Phil told me he'd been interviewed by the FBI on two different occasions and told them emphatically that he did not give me any inside information. So when I went to trial in New York, okay, when, when he gave that money back in and they did the press conference, there were hundreds of stories around the world because of Phil's celebrity that created its perception. So I go to trial in New York. It's all over the New York newspapers about Phil Mickelson. He's going to come in and be in the court. He's going to testify in the jury selection. There were jurors that want to know if Phil Mickelson was going to testify. Okay, so I, I, I go to trial. The government isn't going to call him because they know what he's going to say. He's already been interviewed. He told us he would come and testify. But when it came time, his lawyers called my lawyers and said, if you call him, he's going to take the Fifth Amendment. Well, if someone tells you they're going to take the Fifth Amendment, you can't call them. So Bill Mickelson, he never came forward. He never testified. He never issued a public statement. So all those people in that jury, they read those stories out there. There were hundreds of them on the Internet. And they're looking at the same thing that I would look at or any other normal person would look at. Here's a man that gave a million dollars back in the stock trade. Why would you do that if, if you hadn't done something wrong or someone did something wrong? Well, what people didn't know was he gave a million back, dollars back in the stock trade. In exchange, he got dropped out of a very serious money laundering investigation. They had nothing to do with me. And the man he wired the money to, he let him go to prison. And I... And, and I go to prison for 31 months and my daughter commits suicide. So Phil's no longer a friend of mine. And, and, and very understandably, uh, in the book, you did have that, you know, as you mentioned, that, um, that betting partnership for, was it four years? Five years, to sir. It was five, five years. years. Yes, sir. Um, and, and the book does detail some of the statistics uh, that, about around Phil and I won't get into to all the specific numbers folks are gonna read the book and and um, get to see uh, if they're interested um, but but some numbers are, are pretty eye-popping uh, around Phil's betting one um, mentioning him betting uh, one billion dollars over the last three decades uh, losing uh, losses of a hundred million over the 20 year period beginning in the mid nineties. So, um, very active betting, um, active even during tournaments. And, um, there was one bet, uh, that even made you uncomfortable that you, that you detail in the book, um, that he had suggested. Uh, can you tell us about that? Well, it wasn't actually what he suggested. What happened was, uh, they were playing the Ryder cup at Madonna in 2012 and Phil called me up and he wanted to bet $400,000 on, uh, on the U.S. team in the Ryder Cup, he wanted me, he wanted to know if I could bet the four hundred thousand dollars for him, and I, I said, well, you, "Have you lost your mind?" I said, "You know, do you know what happened to Pete Rose?" I said, "You know, you 
people look at you as almost like a modern day Arnold Palmer. I said, uh, you, you, you destroy your whole career. I said, I don't want any part of this. I said, there's no way. You know, he said, Oh, okay. And that, that was it. Now he didn't bet anything at all with me on, on the Ryder cup. He never attempted before or after to bet anything on golf. I want to make that really clear. And I don't know what he did with that Ryder cup or he didn't do, but the fact that he called me and he wanted me to bet $400,000 for him. I mean, I, uh, I, I was in shock. Yeah. The, um, there's another scene in the story where you're now out of prison um, and you run into him at Rancho Santa Fe. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that conversation went? I've been hitting balls on the range and I was headed to the first tee and I was walking off the first tee. And from where I was hitting balls, the first tee is probably, I don't know, 30, 35, 40 feet. He met me about midway, he just walked up and... Uh, and he told me, oh, it was so great to see me back playing golf. He had a big smile on his face. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, and then he went in to tell me, as he started to tell me why he didn't testify. And I stopped him. I said, you know, give me, don't give me the bullshit. I said, you know, you and I both know the truth. And, uh, and, uh, and I told him that, uh, you know, that I will never forgive him. My daughter committed suicide while I was in prison. And uh, he said he was sorry, and that was it. I haven't spoken to him since. The entire time I was in prison, I never heard from him. Uh, 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 the uh, so no, I haven't. Uh, but that was it. Was a brief engagement. It was just he and I. The other members of the club they knew our history, and uh, you know it looked like a stink bomb had gone off. Uh, people cleared out, so it was just he and I. And there was no shouting. There was none of that. It was just a conversation between two men and uh uh i felt like it was very disingenuous and uh and uh uh i think he knew how i felt when i left do you hope that he reads the book i don't really care whether he reads the book or not now he's changed his persona this has sort of been marketed or not marketed but there's been talk out there that this is uh, a book that Phil fears or something like that. He's changed so much in the last couple of years that uh, I wonder if that's the case or I wonder if some of that changing in his persona is, um, has anything to do with the fact that some of, the, some of these stories will be coming out. I don't know. Well, as I noted in the book, there are a lot of things about Phil that I could have put in this book that I didn't put in this book. The only thing I put in this right. book was what I needed to put in the book to, to set the record straight. My, my whole goal and what I wrote here was to correct a, mis, a, a misconception. Okay, there's a misconception that's been created out there. I had to write what I wrote in order to clear that up, to tell the truth. Yep. Okay, I didn't put anything, I didn't put anything in there in, any more or any less. And there are a lot of things that could have gone to this book pertaining to his personal life that, uh, you know, that I think is well, well known throughout the golf community. Uh, it's not in there. Uh, that's for, that's for others to write. But, uh, look, uh, I, I actually think Phil is a better actor than he is a golfer. I, I think he's one of the best golfers who ever lived. He's certainly the best left, left-handed player to ever live. But I think Phil would have a, a big, big, uh, career, uh, in Hollywood. I think he's a fabulous actor. There you go. Indeed. Um, the trial that you referred to, it takes up um, a, a, towards the end of the book, we get uh, a close look at the indictment and the players involved. And um, it's a complicated situation with different misdeeds and bad actors. Um, here and there on both sides and um but as you read it sort of laid out and and you make a very clear um a, a very clear and thorough case in the book that what you were trading on was as you had it was what you'd been trading on your entire life in, in wall street which was public information um so you read this and uh you think okay the case is made very clearly why wasn't it made so clearly in court uh, why do you, how does the jury come back guilty? It's one of the, as you, as you read the story, it's kind of, a, it's certainly head scratching. 
I'm sure it was for you. Yeah, it was for, it was for me. I knew every bit of the evidence uh, regarding uh, the case before I went to New York. Uh, uh, if if I thought I was going to be found guilty, there was a possibility I was going to be found guilty. I would never gone to trial. I would have saved hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, well, the hundred of million dollars I'd have saved. I, I'd have certainly probably got less time than I got if if I hadn't gone to trial. Uh, but I knew every bit of the evidence. I I, uh, I would have bet a lot of money that I would have been found innocent. I'd, I'd been to federal court before. I thought I understood the system, and uh, but I'd never been to federal court in the Southern District in New York, and uh, that was entirely different. Now, I had 31 months to think about how I got convicted, and I've got a pretty good idea. It's, it's kind of like replaying a ball game in your mind after you've lost it. You know, there's you can always figure out a way you could have won it after the fact, but... Uh, uh, you don't get that opportunity, and uh, but there, there's some. What people probably don't realize is is, and a, and a court in federal court, the federal judge, he he, he can pretty much decide whether somebody gets found guilty or innocent, and the way he runs the court, the evidence he allows in, the evidence he doesn't allow in, uh, things such as that, and you're going to find. Some governments that are, I mean, some judges are very pro-government judges. Uh, you're going to find some that are maybe not as pro-government, that are, you know, are more along, you know, being fair to everyone. As I put in the book, there were four uh, major things that uh, that the jury didn't know when they convicted me. And, and, and I leave it up to the reader to come to their conclusion themselves whether I would have been found guilty or not. But uh, there was an FBI agent, his name was David Chavez. Uh, he was a supervisor in charge of all the white collar crimes uh, in New York. Uh, he'd been there for a number of years, uh, and the cases of Preet Bharat brought in New York. He edited every one of those cases up. He had my case from the beginning to the end, three and a half years. Okay, they kept planting these these stories kept getting planted in the in the in the, in, in, in the media. Some were true, some weren't true. But the bottom line was, this was against the law. They were leaking grand jury information. So we filed a motion. We alleged that this happened. Uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, Preet Bahar, came back and said, no, this didn't happen. You know, they made fun of us. They said, well, we're on a fishing expedition. Well, the judge uh, ordered an evidentiary hearing. And when he ordered the evidentiary hearing, uh, three days prior to the hearing, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they sent a letter over in camera. That means it's secret to the judge said judge yeah we did do this and uh the person who did it was david chavez a supervisor in charge of the white collar crime unit for the fbi and uh but we want you to keep this private please don't tell anybody it'll hurt our reputation and we recommend you hold david chavez in contempt of court and uh so the judge uh our lawyers found out about it filed all kinds of motions and finally the judge he made the letter public. And in the letter, uh, they turned over seven emails out of 2,000 they had. And they said the other the rest of the emails they looked at, they were okay. But there were seven emails in there that they turned over where they admitted uh, what they did. And uh, the copy of the emails are in the book, and it explains in detail what happened. So one of the things that the jury never knew uh, when and, and this FBI agent, by the way, was suspended. The judge who was conducting the trial referred his case to the Office of Public Integrity and recommended that he be indicted for two felonies, criminal, criminal contempt and obstruction of justice. Okay? The U.S. Attorney's Office then sent over uh, an affidavit saying that he was so untrustworthy and so unbelievable you couldn't, he couldn't believe him about anything, that they, they could no longer count on anything that he said, basically, so we couldn't put him on a stand. So when a jury went back and convicted me, uh, they never knew any of this stuff. They never knew that the man who put the entire case together on me had been suspended uh, and that the people who were prosecuting me at representing him as being so untruthful and uh, and so dishonest that no one can believe him. The judge the judge never allowed them to know any of that. Okay, that was one of the things they didn't know. The government had 60 days of wiretaps against me. 
they never played one in court. Okay. Jury never knew that. Phil Nicholson. He had given two interviews to the FBI, emphatically denied I ever gave him any inside information. They never knew that. Phil wouldn't come forward and testify. That judge up there that was conducting the trial, the guy that they looked at every day like their grandfather, uh, when they were out of the room. That same judge described this guy Chavez uh, and said he should be indicted for two felonies. So there were four things that this jury didn't know when they convicted me. So uh, I got convicted. I'm a convicted felon. Nothing will ever change that uh, unless I get a presidential pardon one day, and I'll, I'll still, it still will have happened. But uh, the, uh, and the trades themselves. The biggest mistake I made in the entire trial was not testifying. Uh, but frankly, uh, another reason that, that I'm sure I wouldn't have got convicted if Phil had testified, the only witness they had in this case against me was a guy who two years prior to this had given a voluntary interview to the FBI and, and the Attorney General's uh, uh, and, 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 and the prosecutors and denied emphatically that he'd ever given me any of that information. Only after they learned that he committed three or four other felonies, including giving someone else inside information, and he was staring 15, 20 years in prison, then he changed his story. And they had to meet with him 29 times to get his story straight. And then during the trial, we, we caught him in at least 25 lies. He had no credibility with the jury at all, none. So if Phil had come forward with his celebrity and had simply just said in court and told the truth that I never gave him inside information as far as he knew, that, that would have been someone who would have testified other than this one man. Okay, if Phil had, okay so now the jury is going to go back. Are they going to believe Phil Mickelson or are they going to believe this guy Tom Davis? Okay, well, they didn't, they didn't have that choice because Phil wouldn't testify. They didn't know these other four things that I just pointed out either. So I got found guilty. And in the eyes of the law, I'm guilty. I'm a convicted felon. You go to Pensacola, and that experience is detailed very vividly uh, and well detailed in the book. There's a really stirring story there about Little Joe. Can you tell us about Little Joe? Sure. Uh, when I went to prison, as you can imagine, it was an adjustment. It was very, very negative. And then what happened is, is uh, I ended up meeting and uh, mentoring uh, two dozen men, and Little Joe was one of them. Uh, Little Joe had came to Pensacola from the, the Atlanta uh, house, uh, the Atlanta prison, which was a high, high security prison, and and according to the people inside the prison, probably the worst prison in the United States. And he was the shot caller of a Mexican gang uh, is what he was there. So I, I met this guy. I didn't know his background. Uh, I met a guy who was very depressed, uh, very angry. He'd given up on the world. And uh, and uh, uh, I got acquainted with him a little bit. And uh, I, I, I really believe that, that there was something there more than that. So I started working with him a little bit. I found out he'd had a daughter who uh, he'd never met. He'd never laid eyes on. She was born after he'd gone into prison. He'd been in the prison at the time 17 years. And uh, anyway, he, I got him a job at the laundry. And uh, he, uh, and prior to meeting me, when he had enough, when he had money, which was, wasn't very often, he would put money in his commissary account and he would call his daughter when he could. But he couldn't always call her because he didn't have the money. But after we met, you know, he was able to call his daughter. He was able to talk to her, but he never met her. So, uh, and then after we met, he, uh, he started, uh, he had an incredible talent. He could look at a picture and he could draw that, hand draw that identical picture by just looking at it. And he would sell those pictures for 20 bucks to inmates if they brought him a picture. Then he got involved with, uh, parents day. He'd be over there. He'd be, be playing with the kids. He'd set up games for them and things like that. Well, his daughter, uh, and her mom, they lived in, in, in Iowa. Uh, they worked at a pizza hut, and he never met them. So, and he said, I'd give anything in the world to meet my daughter. So I said, well, let me go to work on it. So 
have my people on the outside to go to work. We located them and we arranged for the mother and the daughter to fly to Pensacola. And uh, so they flew there and uh, uh, arranged for a visit to see Joe. And uh, she came in at night and uh, I've never seen anything any more emotional in my life. Uh, the, uh, when the two of them met, it was just, uh, it was, it was really very, very emotional. They were in obviously tears and they were shaking, trembling. And, uh, but to see them re- re- reunited, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was really nice. And, uh, Joe, uh, he goes on to, uh, he's really doing well. He's out of prison now. He's got a job at a Kia dealership in Orlando, Florida, and he's doing exceptionally well. But uh, Joe was a guy, uh, I'm as sure as I am talking to you, that would have never gotten out of prison had, had we not met. And that, to me, was, uh, uh, it was, if nothing else, that was worth going to prison over. It's a really emotional and beautiful story to read. Um, you leave the book and we understand that going forward, uh, you know, one of your interests or passions is uh, helping um, convicts uh, when they're released, uh, find their way. Well, um, yeah. yeah. Well, when I was in prison, I was, you know, there, I was looking for something I could do to make things better for people there. I mean, the nutrition, you can't help the, the facilities, you can't help the, uh, healthcare. You're not, you're not going to be able to do anything about that. So when I got out of prison, I started working with Senator Harry Reid and I wanted to put vocational schools into federal prisons. Unfortunately, Harry, Senator Reid died. And, uh, but there's a reentry program in Las Vegas that's called Hope for Prisoners, and it's ran by a guy named John Ponder. It's the best reentry program of its kind in the United States. And Susan and I have gotten involved with them. We've given them quite a bit of money. They've taken it. They've bought uh, facilities. They've bought resources. Uh, we now have vocational schools going into federal prisons in Las Vegas. Uh, it's something that uh, I am so proud to be involved with. It's, uh, I can't put it into words. So it's awesome, um, and and a lot of people are being helped. So um, some good, certainly yes. coming out of uh, right. an extraordinary. Uh, it's a very uh, a, a tough situation. Um, there are so many stories in the book, Billy. We could talk. We could sit here and talk <laughs> all day, and and we really could. It's uh, so many lives within one life, and so many stories that you tell, and they're so well told. Um, and there's a lot of different use in this book in terms of, you know, a pool player, a poker player, a golfer, a philanthropist, a, con- a convicted felon, a car salesman, a golf course owner, an operator. We didn't even get to talk about that, all your all your golf courses, uh, a Wall Street, you know, investor, your sports gambling business, um, father, husband. Now you're an author. Um, which of those most accurately do you think describes who you are? Oh. A gambler. <laughs> a gambler. There you go. Oh well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that probably most describes me for who I am. But the, uh, I still enjoy it as much as I did the day that I uh, started. And uh, again, I've had a lot of fun, a lot of enjoyment out of it, met a lot of uh, interesting people. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe all of those things describe me. I don't know. Uh, when I really think sure. about it. Uh, I love all those things. No one's ever asked me that question. I've never really thought about it. Well, you had so many chapters in, in your life doing different things. And uh, again, they're, and they're all good chapters to read. In the end of the book, I'll leave, we'll leave with this question. You reflect and you, you ask a big question on the last page. Um, was I a good man or not? Uh, what's the answer? Uh, I was a good man. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm confident I was a good man. And, uh, the, uh, you know, my words, my bond, I've, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've lived a good life and uh, I've helped a lot of people and, uh, and, uh, I look at myself in the mirror and I like the man I see. Well, there you go. And many chapters yet to come, Billy. And, uh, we hope maybe you'll come back and join us some time to talk about them where we'll see you out there on the golf course. We thank you so much for your time and wish you all the success with the book. Tom, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 